everyone. Welcome back to the Increase Your Energy Summit. I am so excited about today's guest, who is Evan Brand, who hosts a podcast called Not Just Paleo. And I am a huge, huge fan. And I'm so excited because we're going to talk all about adrenal fatigue today, which is something that I have suffered from you know, for many years before I found the solution, still have symptoms of it. So I'm really excited to talk to him about some of those things. And um, Evan is an author, a podcast host, and a Louisville, Kentucky-based board-certified holistic nutritionist, certified functional medicine practitioner, nutritional therapist, and personal trainer. He is passionate about healing the chronic fatigue, obesity, and depression epidemics after solving his own IBS and depression issues. He uses at-home lab testing and customized supplement programs to find and fix the root cause of a wide range of health symptoms. His Not Just Paleo podcast has, has over 5 million downloads and counting. He's the author of Stress Solutions, REM Rehab, and the Everything Guide to Nootropics. He offers 15-minute functional medicine phone consultations at his site, notjustpaleo.com. Welcome, Evan. Steph, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I am really excited to talk, to talk today about adrenal fatigue, but I'd first love to hear a bit more about your story. What brought you to this place and got you interested in this field? Sure. So I, I tell most people I'm a wounded warrior, like most of us. Yes. Uh, we don't get are. into this by choice. It's typically uh, by necessity, and then it yeah. branches out into choice. Uh, that started for me back in college. I went to business school, and I was ridden with IBS. So mm -hmm. IBS is a generic diagnosis that many people end up with if they go to their doctor or they get referred to like a gastroenterologist, which basically means we have no idea what's going on, but it's a generic diagnosis that something's not right in your gut, but we don't know why. And as people listening may know, because I'm sure your audience is super savvy, that 90 plus percent of your serotonin, which is responsible for re re regulating your mood, comes from the gut, your intestines. And so if you have IBS, there's a huge link between IBS and depression. And so mm -hmm. I had the gut issues that were causing the mental issues. Uh, granted, I was also working third shift at UPS at the time to pay mm -hmm. for college. And your circadian rhythm is very important. The light bulb is less than 200 years old, and we just, we evolved on this planet to wake up with the sun and go to bed with the sun. And so if you look at research, third shift nurses, for example, end up with almost a 50% increase in breast cancer compared to day shift nurses. And so I was going against the planet's rules. I was going against Mother Nature. I was working at midnight and getting off at 5 a.m. and going to bed with the sunrise, which is just terrible. And long story short, it took me several years to figure out that one, there's a link between what you put in your body and how that, how that creates good mood. So I had the food mood connection. I had to figure that part out. And then also, once that was fixed and I removed gluten and dairy, for example, the two biggest triggers out of my diet, then I also had to figure out, well, what other root causes were there? And so I began my career as a nutritional therapist. And then I realized that my clients were getting good success, but not everyone was getting success. And I thought, well, why if client A and client B are both doing, say, an autoimmune paleo diet, why is this girl, why is she still spinning her wheels? Mm. And so that led me into functional medicine because if you go to your conventional doctor and you get lab testing run, typically they're only running labs that are going to diagnose disease. Therefore, the reference ranges are so large with a conventional blood test, for example, that anywhere between, say, 3 and 100, let's say that's the number. If you're anywhere in that reference range of someone who is almost dead who took that blood mm -hmm. test and someone who's feeling great, you're in there. So that just mm -hmm. means you're alive, you're not mm -hmm. dead, and you're not diseased. You're fine. Go home. And mm -hmm. this is just not up to par if people really want to get better. So that's why I went and did a bunch of functional medicine training, and now I run lab tests on every new client across the planet because now I want to find these other answers. Now for me, what happened was I had two parasite infections. Mm -hmm. I had cryptosporidium and giardia, which are two typically um, waterborne parasites. And these are microscopic. People ask, oh my God, am I going to see this in my stool? Probably not. Um, it's possible. Some people see some things, but these things can only be identified by comprehensive stool testing. I lost 25 pounds without trying. Mm. that's when it started to get really scary. You know, the mood issues aside, the IBS issues aside, losing weight and getting to what I thought was very thin, that was a scary experience. And so once I found those parasites, I had to self-treat those. And then the thing about parasites, which you may hit upon with this adrenal topic today, mm -hmm. 
is parasite infections, bacterial infections, candida, all of these different issues that you can have with the gut, they all steal your nutrients. So it doesn't matter if you're eating 100% organic because you've got gut bugs that are stealing your nutrients. And so you're going to have fatigue. You're going to have potential food intolerances because these gut bugs are causing intestinal permeability, which is leaky gut. And so no matter how perfect the diet is, no matter how much bone broth you're drinking, it doesn't matter because if you're just cutting the top of the weed off, but you're not pulling the weed out of the ground, the problem's just going to keep coming back. And so that's why I focus so much now on root cause medicine. Sure, nutritional therapy is still a piece of it, but you really got to get these underlying things figured out that most people just go undiagnosed for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Such an interesting story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's, it's a trip. It's been a, it's been a hell of a journey, but um, I'm never finished and none of us will ever be finished, right? So the goal is not to hit this one point. I noticed with a lot of clients, I work with over a thousand women at this point. A lot of women say, Evan, I'll be happy or I'll be content when like I lose 20 pounds or I could fit back in these jeans or my husband thinks I'm sexy again or whatever it is. They always have these, these places that they have to reach. Mm -hmm. But then once they reach that place, they're still not satisfied. And so I really try to incorporate spiritual health into this as well. You know, helping people to foster good relationships, making sure people actually love themselves, making sure people are not envious because they're just scrolling on social media all the time, looking at other people's perfect lives and perfect bodies. So really the mind, body, spirituality, all of it's important. And you can't just eat your way to health. In my opinion, you do have to factor in other parts of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that approach. So let's shift over to adrenal fatigue a little bit. What, give us some of the symptoms, first of all. And I know we did, I did cover this in another interview, but just top level, what are some symptoms who you know is most susceptible to adrenal fatigue? And maybe we can go into diet a little bit too. Sure. So let's start really zoomed out and we'll zoom in as we go along. So adrenal mm -hmm. fatigue is the buzzword, but technically what we're talking about is adrenal dysfunction or even more technical term, we're talking about HPA axis dysregulation, which is the conversation between parts of the brain, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal glands. And so you have this axis where it's part of your limbic system, part of the brain. And what's happening is you're having a conversation with these glands. They're called adrenal or adrenal or sits on top of kidney gland is what that means. And when you're talking about these glands, they're only doing what the brain is telling them to do. So it's not that these glands are malfunctioning. It's not when you hear adrenal fatigue that the glands are tired. They will never fatigue unless you have an autoimmune condition like um, President Kennedy did. He had Addison's disease where his body was literally attacking his, um, his adrenal autoimmunity, where his body was attacking his adrenal glands, so therefore he could not produce adequate levels of cortisol. And if you don't have cortisol, you're dead. Now, if you have too much cortisol, that's also an issue. Now, what happens is we live in a modern world that's incredibly stressful. It's 24-7 stress. We've got um, EMF, you know, electromagnetic radiation. People can go to antennasearch.com and they can go type in their address and see how many cell phone towers there are within a four-mile radius. There's um, a doctor named Deborah Davis. She's an incredible expert on wireless technology and she's wrote and, uh, written sev several books about cell phones and health and Wi-Fi and all this electromagnetic pollution because there's no long-term studies. And we're finding, and I'm finding as well, a lot of my clients that live near a lot of these towers, for example, the more towers that are near them, the more sick someone is. So, you know, this is, I'm not going to wait 20 years for us to study the long-term effects. I'm going to start taking action and making correlations now. So that's a huge one for me is electromagnetic uh, radiation and, and, exposure to Wi-Fi signals, cell phones, all of that. Mm -hmm. now, what can we do to protect ourselves from that? And if well, we live in New York City, are we screwed? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a tough situation. There are what's called grounding paints. Um, I can't think of the company, but it, the, the paint itself is called T98 Alpha. But if you just type in like grounding paint, mm -hmm. literally an electrician has to come in and hook this paint up. Hmm. They implant a wire into your into your wall where the paint is you you paint this wire into your wall and you put that into your ground mm -hmm. so all houses when you look at where you plug in your electronics the bottom little mouth of the electrical plug is the ground and that has to be grounded just so you don't blow up your laptop when you plug it in 
So for someone that lives in a high rise, for example, we know that for every floor that you go up in a high rise building off the ground, you're further separating yourself from the Schumann resonance, which is the 7.83 Hertz that the earth puts off. Mm. You're designed to, to hear and feel earth's natural song mm-hmm. and the higher you go up the further you're separated away from that and so what you could do is you can you can ground your bedroom so what that paint does is it blocks out uh, rf signals so cell phone towers wi-fi uh, cellular data you can block all of that out so that's one thing is shielding there's bed canopies for example like silver silver lined bed canopies that you can they kind of look like a mosquito net mm-hmm. you can sleep mm-hmm. under those Um, But for me, you know, my wife and I moved out to the country and we live on 16 acres. There's no Wi-Fi. I have no Wi-Fi in the house and we hardwire everything. Mm -hmm. And we're about to move even further out into the country just because uh, there's a cell phone tower too close for my Mm -hmm. comfort level over there. Uh, And it's it's not worth it. Uh, So that's that's a bit off topic. But in terms of symptoms, what would people be experiencing? There are some clients that I have. I mentioned this because there are some clients I have that come to me because of how many podcasts I've done on this subject because not many people are talking about this. And I do have clients that are diagnosed with EHS, which is uh, basically electromagnetic sensitivity. And I've had clients that say they can feel when they go into someone's house if they have a Wi-Fi router on or they can feel if someone has a cordless phone Mm. if they go into their room it's a curse and a blessing to to have that, but it severely limits where people can go. I mean, Target, Starbucks, all these places have Wi-Fi, and those sensitive people, they really, really have to get healed before they can go Mm -hmm. back into those environments. And a lot of work I do is with the adrenals, Mm -hmm. but also the gut. So I'm sure we'll talk about that. I'm going to get a sip of tea so I can catch my breath and see if I wanted to comment on that. (laughs) Well, my next question was going to be, you know, to get back to what some of the root causes are of adrenal fatigue. Totally. Yeah. So for me, you know, EMF is going to be one of them for sure. Um, Other causes are going to be blood sugar dysfunction. So if your blood sugar is spiking and crashing due to a diet that's rich in refined sugars or carbohydrates, if that blood sugar goes up and that blood sugar crashes, what happens is the adrenal glands act as a backup generator for blood sugar regulation. Now, typically what happens is you know, if we're focusing on a pretty nutrient dense diet, pretty low glycemic diet, that means we're not causing massive spikes in the blood sugar. And so let's say we do eat a handful of organic blueberries. Perfect. Blood sugar is going to go up just a bit, but it's such a small amount of sugar that the pancreas is going to be able to secrete insulin levels and then get that blood sugar back down into a normal range. Now, what happens with blood sugar dysfunction, you know, especially in type 2 diabetes, that's the worst manifestation of this, is you've got people that are eating, let's say, a bagel or a pastry or a muffin for breakfast. That blood sugar is going to spike back up, and it's going to get so high that the pancreas is not going to be able to secrete enough insulin to get that blood sugar back down. Now, what has to happen next is the adrenal glands have to kick in, and they have to start making cortisol noradrenaline and adrenaline, which are various hormones that the adrenal glands produce to act as an emergency backup generator to try to bring this blood sugar down before someone ends up in a very bad situation. Now, the problem is as soon as the adrenal glands get involved, now the adrenal glands are not focused on the task of maintaining your fight or flight response. Now your adrenal glands are doing something they shouldn't supposed to. It's like, um, what was that movie with Adam Sandler? It was like the Waterboy movie where you know, you've got a water boy coming and, and trying to play on the football team. You've got some, you've got part of the body that's not supposed to be dealing with blood sugar, dealing with blood sugar. Mm. So blood sugar dysfunction is huge, you know, just, so that would include the overconsumption of sugar, plain enough. Um, it's sad. You see these teenage girls that go to Starbucks now. Nobody went to Starbucks when I was a teenager. I don't even know if Starbucks was around, but now you've got 13, 14, 15 year old girls going to Starbucks because they think it's cool and they're getting a vente latte and it's actually a dessert. It's 80 to 100 grams of sugar. Mm-hmm. And that's more than I tell anyone to drink or have in terms of sugar per week almost. Yeah. And some people are doing two or three Starbucks a day. Yeah. Um, you've got inflammation as a cause of adrenal issues. We could spend a whole hour just on that, but we won't. Um, food intolerances. So if you've got gluten, you've got dairy, you've got soy, you've got peanuts, you've got corn, you've got legumes, you know, any of these typical allergenic foods in the diet, that's going to cause issues because that's going to cause poor gut health. And we spoke about the link between leaky gut and adrenal issues a bit. Um, not enough dietary fat. So if somebody's on a low fat diet or they were a vegetarian or a vegan, 
their hormone levels are terrible. And I've tested a thousand women, so I speak from experience. I've got the data to show you. This is a woman who is vegetarian or vegan for five years, and this is after she added back in eggs and meats. And look at her hormones now, because you have to have uh, cholesterol to produce hormones. Cholesterol is at the very top of the chart. So if someone wants to type in in Google cholesterol steroid hormone pathway, you can look and you can see how dietary cholesterol is the top foundation of your diet, which comes from good grass-fed animals, organic eggs, butter, etc. And what happens is cholesterol is the building block of hormones. If you go on a vegetarian or a vegan diet, you're going to be and you're going to end up with low cholesterol. Then you cannot make your hormones. Same thing with older people as they get put on statins. Uh, typically, if I'm looking at a 50 to 60 year old woman who's been on statin medication, not only is that depleting CoQ10, which sets you up for heart issues later in life, but also it does deplete adrenal hormones. And so we'll look and see their adrenal hormones. Um, so, so, what do you recommend for someone who is a vegan or vegetarian? They've got to they've got to stop the vegetarian or vegan diet because it's going to destroy them. It's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. Mm -hmm. Now, people may say, "Oh, I feel so good though," or "I just I can't eat meat." Typically, people can't eat meat because they have a gut infection, like H. pylori, which is a bacteria that kills the parietal cells in the gut that make hydrochloric acid. Now, if you have that gut infection, your body cannot make stomach acid. Therefore, yes, you are going to feel better when you don't eat meat because your body can't handle meat. It's too intensive to break down. So you've got to find the root cause. Why do you feel better when you don't eat meat? Typically, it's due to a low stomach acid issue, which is caused from not chewing your food, which is caused from um, scrolling on Instagram while you're supposed to be eating. Uh, it's caused from these other infections. And so uh, typically what I do, as long as someone's open to it, if they're not open to ditching the vegetarian vegan diet, I don't even work with them. Mm. You know, I'm typically booked out a month, so I, I don't have time for people that aren't ready mm -hmm. to get better. But if they are ready, I'll say, okay, look, Jane, we've got to start adding in egg yolks. And then we start adding in a little bit of some fish, for example. And then we start adding in just a tiny little piece of some grass-fed meats or pastured chicken. And we just slowly work them up as we're looking for root causes. And then we're also adding in hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes to make sure they can actually digest the, mm -hmm. the foods. So would someone be able to add back in, you know, fish and meat for a short amount of time and then go back to their vegetarian diet? Mm, I don't know why somebody would want to do that, though. Well, maybe for moral or ethical reasons. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with the moral ethical part. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of bad things that happen to animals. Um, all of my meat comes from within about a 30 mile radius of my house. There's a bison farm that I source bison meat down the street. Uh, there's also a thousand acre farm that has grass fed uh, pigs or pastured pigs rather. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not really eating grass, they're eating bugs and, and worms. But um, I'm totally on board with the ethical reasons. I agree that factory farming is terrible and I don't condone or support that in any way. However, you know, looking at the data and looking at the work of Weston A. Price, who wrote the book um, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, uh, back in the 1920s, him and his wife, they traveled around the planet on boats and studied hunter-gatherer or what was left of the tribal societies in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And he never found a single healthy vegetarian or vegan uh, person. Here's the other thing, too. Let's take you, for example. You live in New York City. And let's say January or February. It's 10 degrees, there's a foot of snow on the ground, but you're a vegetarian or a vegan, you're going to starve to death because there's no green leafy vegetables or beans or anything like that that's growing. The only thing that would be out in that type of weather, mammals, deer, elk, moose, bison, prehistorically. So if you just look at the possibility, the only reason it would be possible to be a vegetarian or vegan is due to semi trucks bringing in produce from California and Mexico. You know, you're eating a pineapple in New York and in February. It's like, whoa, your biology does not understand how that's happening. It's looking outside and seeing winter, but it's seeing pineapple, which is like bottled sunshine, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I know we went down that rabbit hole, but let me get back to a couple more causes yeah. of some adrenal issues. So, too much coffee and stimulants. So, coffee. Uh, especially if you don't have any fat with it. So if you're not putting butter or like coconut oil with your coffee, caffeine is going to stimulate. It's going to whip, whip that, whip that adrenal cycle, mm -hmm. uh, too much exercise. So I've got a lot of CrossFit burnout victims as clients. I'm not a huge fan. Um, some women, they can't even do hot yoga. It's just too much. If they've got other issues. Yeah, I'm one of those. Are you? Yeah. 
yeah, heavy metal toxicity. So this could be mercury, this could be copper from IUDs. Um, heavy metals do impact the adrenal glands. So this is huge. Low zinc status. Once again, if you have bad digestion, you're not eating meats, zinc deficiency is huge. And that can also cause an issue with adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. I'd love to talk some more about the heavy metals because I know IUDs, you know, are such a hot topic and a lot of women go to those as their birth control method of choice. But um, I won't say who it is because not many people know yet, but there's someone in my life who, you know, I recommended she take out her IUD and she's now pregnant. <laughs> that will happen. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, sex does make babies, especially if you don't have an IUD. So yeah. um, yes, this, this is a big cause of copper toxicity. Now there's also people that talk about copper deficiency out there, but you know, primarily I'm working with women who have had IUDs as a primary source of birth control for five, 10 plus years. And that's typically the way this thing works is you're absorbing the copper, which is then basically like all birth controls, you're tricking the body into thinking that you're pregnant. So it never drops the egg. Um, the issue with that is the side effects of this. So women are going to report typically uh, mood swings. They could report anger. They could report rage. They could report um, depression. They can report, yeah, I would say heavy mood swings would be the biggest one where women will say one minute they feel okay. The next minute they're snapping at their husband or their kids. Yeah. So uh, it's huge. Now, what do you do? Well, the fertility awareness method is what I recommend to all women which is where basically there's tons of apps that do this and there's expensive devices you can buy that will track your ovulation, but uh, just old school counting works. Um, what you do is you take the date of your period and you plug that into your app and then the app is going to say, Hey, for these five days, be very careful because this is your highly fertile period. And if you look into the research fertility awareness uh, planning or they call it like family Plan family planning method, I think is also another term for it. It's about 99.7% effective if you do it correctly, mm -hmm. which is far greater than a condom, uh, which is far greater than the um, estrogenic birth control pills, because those are a whole nother issue too. Many women uh, end up with estrogen dominance, where there's a imbalance between estrogen and progesterone, which also causes weight gain, depression, other type of symptoms, food sensitivities, and you can avoid all of that. So mm -hmm. not a fan of any type of let's call it non-paleo birth control. Yeah, yeah. I know there was, um, you know, just a whole movement, like when I went to college and, you know, just everyone getting on birth control and then this whole movement after college of like everyone getting off of it, like, oh, I hated that experience. You know, I felt awful and terrible and I was a completely different person. So now I know many of my friends are, you know, going all natural as well. Perfect. I agree. Yeah. I think it's a good thing. So, you know, in terms of all these symptoms, there's not one cause of adrenal issues. There's a hundreds, hundreds of causes, mm -hmm. even something like just taking life too seriously, uh, type A personalities. Yeah. Uh, got a lot of females out in California. They're just so type A. I had a girl last, uh, what was it last Thursday? And on my intake form, I asked, what are your main sources of stress? And she put herself. Mm -hmm. And so I said, ma'am, why, why is, why are you the main source of stress? And she says, she lives in Simi Valley, which I believe is like the outskirts of uh, Los Angeles. Mm. And she says, Evan, I've always wanted to please others. Mm. Everything I do is to please or impress someone else. And I said, why? I said, is that just the California attitude? Because I've heard this before. Is that just what Californians do is they just want to impress others with their Mercedes and their Lululemon pants and whatever. I'm like, what is it? And she said, well, yeah, part of it's the environment. Everyone's trying to outdo and show off to each other. She said, but part of it, it's just always been me. And so, you know, obviously we don't have the time to go into the details today, but some of this stuff stems from childhood as well, which is part of a good intake form that a clinician should be doing when they're looking at someone with adrenal issues as well. Um, was your father around? I mean, women with daddy issues, they, this is a huge deal. And so if the woman did not feel loved or not feel appreciated mm -hmm. when she was a child or a teenager, she may grow up and always seek attention from other men, even if she's in a relationship, which then causes the stress. And so this stuff can get really deep. And obviously you've got to know when do you refer out for other type of uh, clinicians to come on board and help with these mm -hmm. emotional issues. But yeah, just not feeling good enough, just never feeling adequate to yourself 
is huge. And I just encourage men and women both. You have to find things that you love about yourself because if you expect other people to love you, but you don't love yourself, it's not going to happen. And so really, you know, a lot of this could start just from love. And once you get that dialed in, then you can focus on the other stuff. But if you think that you're going to be able to, um, be talking on your uh, brand new iPhone, you've got your Louis Vuitton purse and you're driving in your Mercedes SUV that's just way too big for you by yourself and you're flying on the highway doing 80 miles an hour speeding and weaving and you think you're going to be healthy because you do green juices, it's not going to happen. There's so many other factors that have to be in place. You've got to be grounded. You've got to be confident with yourself. You've got to love you and you've got to love you know, what you're about if you think you can just burn the candle at both ends, but you eat organic, you're going to fall apart. And we can talk about symptoms whenever you're ready to. Yeah, that was absolutely a part of my healing process too. I had to take a good chunk of time off of like my social life in New York City and just really taking time to find myself and find the things that I loved about myself. You know, it just, it really starts with self-love. Like you can't love others until you love yourself. And that was major in my healing process. Yeah, typically guys, I mean, I'm probably one of the few men that say stuff like that. I mean, men are very closed off emotionally, which I think is just ridiculous. But um, let me talk about some of the symptoms. What would people be experiencing if they had adrenal issues? So obviously fatigue is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. Um, They could have like a decreased tolerance for heat or cold. Mm -hmm. So they're the person who's in the office and they have a jacket on when everybody else is fine. Um, Aches and pains, for example, because we do know that cortisol, which is the stress hormone that is typically dysfunctional. The rhythm is dysfunctional. You're supposed to have high in the morning and low in the evening. If that rhythm gets thrown off, then that cortisol is going to pull apart that uh, tight junction in the gut. And now undigested food particles get into the bloodstream, which could then cause autoimmune attacks. So joint pain could be huge. Uh, Lightheadedness. So if someone goes from a sitting to a standing position and they get lightheaded, woo, I'm about to pass out that's adrenals because there's a hormone called aldosterone that's typically regulated pretty well, but under adrenal stress, aldosterone cannot do its job, which is to regulate sodium, potassium, and blood pressure levels. So what happens is blood pressure can actually get too low, and there's actually a test. There's a functional test that you can do where you lay a client down. They, I believe it's called like a postural hypertension test, but what you do is you lay someone down on a table, uh, And when I was working in, I started my practice, my functional medicine practice in a chiropractor's office. So I had access to these tables and I would lay a client down and you take their blood pressure while laying. And let's say it was 120 over 80. You pump up the blood pressure cuff a second time. They stand up quickly. And within five seconds, you measure their blood pressure again. And if their blood pressure drops, and typically it did, probably 10 to 20 points on average, their blood pressure would then read 100 over 80. That's not good. That's adrenal fatigue right there because your blood pressure is supposed to rise. If you saw a bear, if you and I were hanging out together 50,000 years ago and a bear came, we'd be like, oh my God, we have to run and or fight, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that blood pressure should bump up about five points from 120 to 125. But instead, blood pressure drops because the stress has been so chronic that this hormone aldosterone can now, it, it cannot regulate sodium, potassium blood pressure. So lightheadedness is a huge symptom, um, fatigue or dizziness when you're fasting. So if you go too long in between meals, you feel like you're going to pass out. I'm going to kill someone if I don't eat that type symptom. That's adrenals. Yeah. Um, that was a major symptom for me. It's like every two hours I needed to eat or I got hangry. Big time. Yeah. Got to fuel that fire. Absolutely. Uh, sleep disruption. So this could be a light sleep. Like you are laying there and you wake up and you feel like, man, did I actually sleep? Mm-hmm. or insomnia. You just can't go to sleep. That's another issue. Mm-hmm. Um, cravings for chocolate, cravings for even dark chocolate, uh, caffeine, sugar, any type of food craving in general. It could even be uh, healthy cravings, oh. like cravings for, let's say, an organic brownie, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Headaches is another big one. Irritability and then digestive issues. So, I mean, we could go on and on. I could probably come up with another hundred, but those are the most common symptoms. That is quite a few symptoms, and I think I was guilty of all of those. I was not guilty, but I, I definitely suffered from a lot of those. Yeah, it's so, very, very common. Yeah, so where should someone start if they are suffering from adrenal fatigue? Well, the first thing is you've got to get tested because my philosophy you know, in my practice is test, don't guess, because there's so many different variations, and if this was like a 
a, a type of a webinar where we could look at lab results, you know, I could yeah. show you the difference between two different adrenal fatigue situations, but one would be a low cortisol situation where one would be a high cortisol situation, mm -hmm. right? And so there's many variations in this cortisol rhythm. And so you have to get tested. Now, some practitioners talk about a four-point cortisol test, which is a saliva test. Four-point cortisol tests are good, but they're now outdated. I'm using the new six-point cortisol test, mm -hmm. which measures something called the cortisol awakening response. And this measures how well your adrenal glands are keeping up with the demands of life. So what you do is you roll out of bed, you collect a first morning's urine sample, or not urine, that's another test we could chat about. Mm -hmm. You take a first morning saliva, then you do a plus 30, and then a plus 60, and then you do afternoon, late afternoon, evening. And what that does is that plots your entire cortisol rhythm on a 24-hour, we'll call it a 24-hour chart or graph. Now, if someone is typically fatigued all the time, that cortisol is never going to get into rhythm. So it's like you, you, it's like starting your day with your iPhone charged at 20% and you've got to make phone calls all day. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And we have to charge those batteries, which we may, we may be able to hit a little bit on, you know, treatment for this, but, uh, also, someone that has insomnia, we may see that spike of cortisol in the evening, and we need to use nutrients like phosphatoserine or uh, chamomile tea or other herbs to bring down elevated levels. And so you really can't just go take XYZ adrenal supplement that you find at Whole Foods and expect to get better because there's different herbs for different situations. So if someone is in a more fatigue situation, you might not be able to go straight to the stimulating herbs because you may give someone anxiety or panic attacks. Uh, if someone is feeling overwhelmed, you can't go to the holy basils and the licorice and the other type of adaptogenic herbs that are a bit stronger. You may have to start with the calming herbs like ashwagandha or reishi mushroom or mm -hmm. motherwort and calm them down first before you stimulate them. So there's a very detailed process that I combine the results of that adrenal test and then I combine that with the results of a comprehensive stool test to look for infections. Are these infections causing the adrenal issues? And if we can rule that out, perfect. We know it's diet and lifestyle. And then the urine test I spoke about, that's an organic acids test I run on every new client. And that looks for candida uh, because you can measure candida very effectively with the urine. If someone has a yeast problem, typically they're going to have an adrenal problem. Mm. Why? Well, it's because you, the yeast is going to cause leaky gut, which is then going to allow undigested food particles to get into the bloodstream. That's an internal battle, and mm -hmm. you have to fix that battle. So we have to bring in, whether it's olive leaf extract, we've got to bring oil of oregano, garlic, any type of antimicrobial herb to knock out bacterial infections as well. Because if you just do the diet and lifestyle piece, people will spin their wheels unless you get those other tests identified. Mm -hmm. So speaking of diet and lifestyle, what are some dietary changes that you recommend people make? So typically we're going to be reducing refined carbs. We're going to be focusing on good fats and protein, not too much protein. Uh, I'm a much bigger fan of fat than protein. There's a pathway called mTOR, M-T-O-R, and it's a pathway that is proven that if you overeat protein, that you put extra stress on the kidneys, for example. Fat does not do that. Uh, so coconut oil avocados, olives, olive oils, macadamias, macadamia oils, all of your good fats, you've got your, your saturated, you've got your unsaturated. You want to have a wide variety. Uh, Dr. Mercola, who's a guy I really look up to, he's a godfather of you know, holistic medicine. He said he eats th three avocados a day. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of avocados. So he said he goes to the store when they're on sale for a dollar. He buys 50 of them when they're hard and green and he keeps them in the fridge. And then when he's ready to eat them, he pulls out a couple and yeah, waits a couple of days. Window. Yeah. Yeah. So, exactly. so good fats are going to be helpful. Um, reducing or eliminating caffeine and other stimulants. So yerba mate teas, black teas, coffee, it's just got to go. You're just yeah. not going to heal if, if you're, if you've got caffeine. Um, I, I, people, if they're seeing the video of this, I was sipping on some stuff earlier. Uh, I was sipping on matcha tea, uh, which is, it's a good solution for people that are coming off of coffee. Mm -hmm. Matcha tea does still have a little bit of caffeine. It comes from the same plant as green tea, but it does have a little bit more caffeine, maybe 20 to 40 milligrams of caffeine. However, it does have an amino acid in it called L-theanine, which increases your levels of GABA, which is a calming neurotransmitter in the brain. And so matcha is balanced in the sense that the caffeine is not just going to pump the adrenals. You've got the amino acid that calms mm. you as well. Now, people 
technically, I'm going to give you a little hack. Technically, you could take some L-theanine in capsule form as you drink your coffee, and that will help to prevent the cortisol spike that's going to come from the coffee. Uh, also, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on um, good veggies, and we are going to focus on some starches. So like sweet potatoes, a couple of baked sweet potatoes per week with some good quality butter, organic butter, and cinnamon can go a long way because cinnamon is going to act like a natural insulin because cinnamon contains a trace mineral called chromium that is necessary for proper blood sugar regulation. So, you know, I may say, you know, hey, Steph, tonight I want you to eat a good grass-fed steak and you do a baked sweet potato. And then you'll say, oh my God, Evan, when I ate that starch, I felt so much better. Well, no, okay, man, the adrenals are still taxed. Maybe you're not ready to go to a super low-carb diet. That's kind of the, the hot thing now. Carbs yeah. are evil, right? Um, not necessarily. Sometimes we do have to up the carbohydrates. Some people have gone too low-carb or they've gone to a ketogenic diet, which has many benefits. However, it's at the right place at the right time. If you've got a bunch of gut infections, you've got a bunch of emotional stress, trying to go to a very low carb or a ketogenic diet is actually going to cause more issues in most cases until you get these other underlying causes fixed. Yeah. Then you can do that. I think that my adrenal fatigue was actually at its worst when I was on a low carb diet. Because I used to have a candida infection, I was so afraid of adding back in the sugar and the carbs that I stayed low carb for a very long time. And I, you know, it was, I was a mess. It was a really bad idea. And, you know, I do myself tend to eat paleo. And so I often have to remind myself to, you know, add those carbs back in like quinoa and sweet potato, like you talked about. Yeah. I mean, if we look at other societies too, I mean, you could look at the Japanese, they've got incredible longevity. I mean, they're living into their nineties. There's a lot of other cultures that focus on I wouldn't say a carb-based diet, but they're doing lots of rices. They're doing uh, cassava. They're doing uh, taro root and these other starches, and they're fine, and they look incredibly healthy. And so for us, back to the conversation about um, wireless pollution and cell phones and all that, there are studies that prove that cell phone radiation increases blood glucose. So your blood sugar levels can go up by being exposed to electromagnetic radiation, mm -hmm. where if we're looking at a tribal society in Africa who's eating nothing but starches, they don't have cell phone towers every 500 feet, mm. right? So I'm not saying that's the biggest culprit. Obviously, there's other factors, but I am saying that you've got to consider all things when yeah. you're trying to resolve that's these so issues. That's so interesting. Why did the EMFs raise blood sugar? Well, it's basically hyper-stimulating your brain cells. Mm. So you're getting this electrical influence. We're electrical beings. Your heart runs on electrical impulses. But when you're getting exposed to, say, Wi-Fi signal, which is 2.4 gigahertz, that signal does not exist in nature. They call it NNEMF, which stands for non-native EMF. And so nature, typically, there, there is background electromagnetic radiation. There are, that's how birds know how to fly because of the North and the South Pole. If you pull out a compass... There's a magnetic field that's pointing that compass north, right? So there are natural magnetic fields on the planet. However, we have power lines that are above ground and underground. These power lines, we've got these towers. These are non-native. And so the body is looking for the natural background sources, but it's mm. picking up on these man-made sources. Mm. And so I'm not a, you know, a, say a brain expert. I'm not a neuroscientist, but what my research has found is you're hyper stimulating brain cells so you're just you're vibrating these brain cells back and forth back and forth back and forth which then causes cell death but also it's cranking up blood sugar so mm -hmm. that's the best the best um definition i can i can say for this but i have covered this with people way smarter than me on my podcast so if people just type in like evan brand podcast you can look up i've had several expert doctors there's a guy named dr samuel milham who's in his 80s he wrote the book called dirty electricity and the diseases of civilization and uh, like i said he's in his 80s so he was studying back in the 1950s uh, these farmers where in even parts of kentucky where i live there were farms that did not have electricity and as soon as those farms got electricity we noticed the disease rates of the farmers immediately increased hmm. and there's also a famous study where underground power lines were on this field and when these cows were moved from a regular field to a field where there were underground power lines their milk production dropped by 50 percent wow. hmm. so really interesting now i don't want people to lose sleep over it there are solutions but um 
this is relatively new. Like I said, I mean, electricity, the light bulb, all of this stuff is less yeah. than 200 years old. And we've been on the planet for, depending on um, what caveman bone study you look at, hundreds of thousands of years, we evolved for fire. Yeah. So um, also blue light is also a big one. So um, there's an app that people should download on their computer called Iris. And it's far superior if they've heard of the one called Flux. Mm -hmm. There's one called mm -hmm. Iris that's way better because um, Dr. McCullough, uh, he used a spectrometer, which you point at your computer and it shows you the light spectrums that are coming off and the Flux application that's supposed to block blue light at night, which people are, this may go over their head, but let me zoom back out. Sure. Why is blue light bad? Well, because when you watch the sun setting, the blue light disappears and the sky turns red and pink and orange. This triggers the release of melatonin from the pineal gland to tell you it's ready to, it's time to go to bed. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at a blue screen from an iPhone or a computer at nighttime, you're suppressing melatonin and you're increasing cortisol because what happens in the morning? You get a sunrise, but then the sky turns blue. When your eyes see that blue light, cortisol is a light-driven hormone. That blue light triggers the production of cortisol, which charges your iPhone battery, which is you, the human, so you can get through your day. And Mercola put the spectrometer on his computer, and he pointed it at it when the Flux application was on, and he mm -hmm. found that there was still a pretty massive amount of blue light. Mm -hmm. Even though it didn't look like it, the screen looked pretty orange, there was still quite a lot of blue light coming from it. So Iris, he's tested that one and it's much better. And so I'm talking to you right now using the blue light filter and I leave it on all the, all the time. time. Yeah. Yep. And what about the glasses? I have a pair of glasses that block quite a bit of blue light. And I yep. noticed a huge difference. Like I couldn't even watch a movie before bed. Otherwise I wouldn't be able to sleep for the entire night. But now I put on the glasses and I can, can do that if I so choose to. Yeah, the blue light blocking glasses are great. The brand UVEX, U-V-E-X on Amazon, they're eight bucks. Mm. And uh, actually I saw a talk that Mercola did the other day and he had his blue glasses on in the middle of the day while he was doing a talk because he was in a big conference center that was just blasting him with mm. artificial light. And he was like, yeah. he said, if we had incandescent light bulbs, which are safe, the old school incandescent light bulbs. He said, if you all had incandescent light bulbs, I wouldn't be wearing these glasses. But since you've got those curly bulbs in here, wow. I'm going to wear my glasses. Wow. And so oh, he's, he, he's really geeking out on it. And um, we chatted about that yeah. on my podcast. And I'm so glad that somebody as, you know, as notable as him is getting yeah. into this because it's really going to bring this message to the masses, which is that, you know, to summarize, yes, you can make yourself fat by too much blue light at night. Hmm. Plain and simple. Blue light alone can cause adrenal fatigue? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Because um, you can't have high melatonin and uh, high cortisol at the same time. So when you look at that blue light, you check your iPhone one last time before you go to bed, your eyes think, oh, it's 11 a.m. Let's wake up. Yeah. And therefore, you're not getting deep sleep. You're not going through REM sleep, which is, you know, what I wrote my first book about rim rehab was all about sleep and the influence of blue light. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about this before it hit mainstream. Luckily it's, it's becoming kind of mainstream in the health community that blue light's bad. So thank goodness, because yes, I do believe that uh, blue light at night can cause adrenal issues mm -hmm. without a doubt. Yeah. So you'd recommend maybe if someone is using gl the glasses to put them on as the sun goes down. Perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, our ancestors, did they, did they, Oh, we got to go to bed right when the sun goes down? No, but they probably hung around a campfire, which was the color of fire. It's pretty orange and red. There's not much yeah. blue light in a fire. Yeah. And they would have hung out by a fire for a couple of hours. So mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're mimicking that spectrum. You're putting mm -hmm. on those blue blockers and everything's going to look orange. And that's going to allow your body to think, oh, it's nighttime. Let's go ahead and manufacture melatonin, which is not just a sleep hormone, but it also is one of the most potent anti-cancer hormones that there are. And now there's research looking at people older than 50 or 60 or 70 years old, they don't make as much melatonin and a small dose of melatonin as you get older may be anti-cancer. Mm -hmm. Wow. Let's shift a little bit and talk about exercise and how important it is to you know, not over-exercise and maybe why some people feel really tired after they exercise, you know, like myself, like after doing a hot yoga class. Perfect. So let me plug up my laptop. That way I don't lose my battery on you. Sure. Sounds good. All right, so you brought up the good topic of exercise. Um, now, I am certified in personal training. 
who knows, my certification may have expired or I think it expires this year. So maybe I won't be able to call myself that, but <laughs> I've trained hundreds of women, um, men as well, but I focus a lot of everything I do with women. Uh, and mainly because they're more open to asking for help. Men try mm -hmm. to act like nothing's wrong. Yeah. I don't know what their issue is. Um, but with women, they say something's wrong. I say, okay, great. What women typically do, they're on one end of the spectrum. I've typically found that they'll go to an extreme. So it's either no exercise at all mm -hmm. or they're just going to beat themselves to death. I'm going to do yoga, hot yoga, five days a week. I'm going to do a spinning class. I'm going to do bar. I'm going to do Pilates. It's like, why? Why? Um, does exercise have benefits? Absolutely. However, what does exercise do? It's going to raise cortisol levels and you can give yourself intestinal permeability. I feel like a broken record, but you can give yourself leaky gut just from exercise because you have to remember cortisol is a catabolic hormone, which means it breaks things down. So you can start to lose muscle mass if you're overtraining. Mm. And people are thinking, Evan, I'm working out more, but I'm not building muscle. Why? Well, because cortisol is a catabolic hormone. It's going to eat your uh, muscle tissue away because muscle is the first thing to go. Muscle is way easier to break down than fat. People think mm -hmm. you can uh, keep exercising and exercising and burn body fat. It doesn't happen. You're going to burn muscle is what you're going to do. And so what are the two variables that we have for exercise? Well, we have the dosage. So how long is an exercise session? If someone has or suspects adrenal issues based on what we've talked about, then they need to limit exercise to no more than 30 minutes maybe even less, maybe even 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, these and one hour of exercise. Perfect. Yeah. I was just going to get to that. So mm -hmm. in terms of timing, a one hour spinning class is not going to, not going to be approved. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be approved would be something low intensity. So walking, hiking, stretching, light yoga or beginner's yoga, not this, you got a bunch of subwoofers in the background, yeah. you know, enter the downward dog. You know, I've been to some classes where it feels like a yoga boot camp more than yoga. Um, yeah. It needs to be relaxing yoga, like senior yoga, where it's very slow and gentle and restorative. If you feel worse after exercise, that's a bad sign. Yeah. If you're getting back to the car and you're struggling to start the key, you're like, oh my gosh, you either did too much in terms of intensity or too long. And so you really have to start at ground zero. Some women, they've got such bad adrenal issues that just walking to their uh, mailbox, which I don't know what the situation's like in New York. Maybe people don't have long driveways, but some, you know, my driveway is yeah, my driveway is very long. Like it's yeah. a football field to the, to the mailbox. And yeah. so some, you know, some people could walk to that and feel fatigued just from that. And so yeah. we've really got to baby step them. Um, so remember the two levers you've got folks are duration. How long is the workout? And then what is the intensity? Our ancestors, they were not doing one hour spinning classes. If they wanted a deer, they would have sprinted for a few minutes to go kill the deer and then it was all over. But otherwise what they were doing is they were hiking hours. They were walking through the forest, slow, calm, relaxed. Mm -hmm. They were probably meditating a lot, daydreaming. Mm -hmm. That's the exercise we're designed. And then a few minutes of some quick high intensity stuff. Um, sprinting, can that be okay? Eventually, yes. But typically sprinting's got to go to generally yeah. generally all high intensity stuff has to go until someone feels better yeah i think that there's this mentality in new york that you know people are so busy that they want to like fit in their workout and make it really intense and just get the most from it and at the gym i go to it's actually they don't really have like you know easy yoga classes they're all like these really high intensity vinyasa classes and for a period of time, I found those to be even too intense. So I just started doing yoga at home because it's actually hard to find those kind of classes here in New York. Wow. Yeah. And I, I've had clients in New York. I've heard the same thing, which is crazy to me. Now, um, something that people have to realize is that if you feel better after exercise, that could also be a bad sign. And not always. Let me, let me elaborate mm. on that. What I'm saying is if you feel exhausted, you go in and you're the type of client that says, Evan, after I do my XYZ, I feel so much better. What that tells me is that you're so depleted in terms of hormones, you're using the exercise just like you would use coffee to artificially crank up cortisol. You get your rush of endorphins and then you're on this high. But then that high crashes and by 2 p.m. you feel terrible and you want to take a nap and eat a cookie. Mm. Uh, 
So yes, you should feel good after exercise, but it should not be a significant change. If you're just dragging and then after the exercise, you feel amazing. That's a sign that you're starting your day with that battery not charged. And then you're plugging that battery up again, but it's not, it's not a sustainable way. And eventually feeling getting that high after exercise will eventually transition into feeling low Mm. and worse after exercise. Mm -hmm. So it really is a finesse, this Mm -hmm. whole exercise piece. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about another thing that a lot of New Yorkers are guilty of, which is stress. I feel like there's a really big emphasis placed on being busy and people just don't take the time to relax and take time for themselves. And can you explain why stress, you know, can be worse for some people with adrenal fatigue? Sure. Um, My second book I wrote is called Stress Solutions, and that was my dealings with stress. I moved to Austin, Texas, which is like a small Los Angeles, basically, Mm -hmm. and uh, I got burned out there. It was the same type of attitude. What do you drive? What can you do for me? What's your business? Everybody's an entrepreneur, right? Everybody's got this side hustle, and it just it's annoying, for one, and two, it's not sustainable, this go, go, go lifestyle. Uh, People wear it like a badge of honor that they're so busy. Oh, what have you been up to? Oh, I haven't heard from you. Oh, sorry, I'm so busy. I don't want to be busy. You know what I want to be in life? I want to have enough time to do whatever I want whenever I want. My goal is never to be busy. My goal is to help millions of people get better. My goal is to help millions of people feel amazing. My goal is to help millions of people have a breakthrough that being on the um, most of the time self-induced rat race, this wheel, most of the time, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. That's it. People have to learn to say no. If you don't say no, if you're a yes, a yes man or a yes woman, you're probably going to end up with adrenal issues. Oh, hey, Evan, do you want to go to dinner? Yes. Oh, do you want to go to this party? Yes. Oh, my friend's opening this new clothing shop. Do you want to go to the opening? Oh, do you want to go to this yoga class? Do you want to go to the park? Do you want to go get coffee? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, do you see how there's no time for rest and relaxation? Mm -hmm. If we use the lens of our ancestors, what were they doing? Well, if you know you're a woman, you would have been hanging out with other women. You would have been gathering some berries, potentially some nuts and seeds for the day, and the men would have been out in the woods looking for a kill. And you would have been in a relaxed state. You would have been talking and laughing and hanging out with the children. Um, a lot of tribal cultures, they breastfeed up until two to three years, so you're really bonding with your children. You're not just dropping them off at a daycare and seeing them for one to two hours in the evening after you get off work. It was a completely different lifestyle. And now, Not everyone has the luxury of mimicking that lifestyle, but I promise if your end goal, which it probably is, because if you're anything like me, your end goal in life is happiness. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be achieved by working a little bit harder or getting a little bit more money. I have clients that some of them are millionaires and they're miserable. And I've got some clients that make forty to fifty thousand dollars a year. They take one vacation that they have to scrap the funds to do it, and they're the happiest people you can ever believe. And so if you put yourself on this wheel because you think when I have 500 grand in the bank, I'm going to be happy and my life's going to be awesome, you're probably going to be disappointed if you get that 500 grand. Now, uh, people say, well, I'd rather cry in a Ferrari. I understand. Yeah, (laughs) I mean, for sure. However, you've really got to zoom out and look at yourself. And I always tell people, if you brought someone over from, let's say, uh, Papua New Guinea, you know, some of the last um, hunter gatherers on this planet, and they watched your daily routine, would they think you're insane? If the answer is yes, then maybe you should try to go a little bit more natural with your lifestyle. Yeah. And I know it comes down to, you know, at least for me, it was about using my intuition, like certain things that, you know, no one else would think of as being stressful or stressful for me, like, you know, wearing high heels, like, I literally felt depleted when I would wear, you know, even heeled boots um, or like taking the subway to work. And so finally I was just like, all right, flat shoes and Ubers. Like it's, it was some, just something I had to do for myself and it helped a lot. Love it. Love it. You and I would get along quite well. Um, <laughs> if you so. ever come to Kentucky, let me know. But uh, yes, I've had a foot doctor on the show. I can't think yeah. of his name now, um, but I'm sure people could search my podcast history and find it. And this foot doctor talked about how one of the biggest causes of stress for people is uh, musculoskeletal, which is something we haven't mentioned. And so, you know, women that are wearing heels, you're um, tightening up that calf muscle and 
you're changing that whole uh, postural chain. And so the calf goes up to your quadricep and to your hamstring, which then goes up into your butt and then to your lower back. And if you throw that whole chain off, you're physically stressed Mm -hmm. as well, right? So posture is also part of this sitting too much, not getting enough movement. If you expect to sit all day for eight hours and then go do a one hour yoga class and think that you're going to be healthy, you might not. Now, am I guilty of sitting? Of course I sit, you know, I do emails and consultations for a living. However, I do have a little bamboo like standing desk attachment. It's not a full standing desk. It's just something that the laptop sits on. Mm -hmm. So I will alternate between standing and sitting, but then also, you know, I've got plenty of uh, grass out here to go explore. So mm-hmm. I'll take the baby, strap her on, and uh, we'll go for a walk together. We'll take take mom with us, and you know, we'll go for a we'll go for a walk. We'll take the dog, and in the middle of the day, we'll try to get two to three ten minute breaks. Yeah, just break up the city. Second, I also have to plug in my laptop because we're running a bit longer than I expected. Sure. Hold on. Okay. This is great info. So it sounds so it sounds like you've convinced yourself that you uh you need to move from New York. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely had thoughts about it for sure. Yeah, it's a little can be a little bit stressful living here, but I found my way. You know, I've I've Perfect. I've definitely shaped my life to be more supportive of my adrenals. I you know, Love work from it. home. This is my home office and you know, I shop at the farmers market multiple times a week and so really had to make big lifestyle adjustments, but it was worth it. Love it. And it's all about adaptation too. You know, at the end of the day, this conversation, it's not what happens to you in life. It's how you respond to it. So you could have two people that have the same situation. They're stuck in traffic or they're stuck on the subway and you could have one guy that's just singing away and he just loves life. And then you could have another guy that's just so miserable and angry that he's on the subway. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you can have two similar situations, but two different responses. Now I can never make, make a you know, a magic pill or have a magic wand that magically takes someone's stress away. But with mm-hmm. the use of supporting blood sugar, getting the diet dialed in uh, and using specific adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha, rhodiola, shishandra berry, holy basil, et cetera, depending on the lab test, I'm going to base these uh, supplement protocols on. Those things can really help people. And what I was drinking uh, was matcha tea, but in this matcha tea, I also had some herbal tinctures. So I used uh, ashwagandha root, also motherwort and reishi mushroom, Mm -hmm. which is like an immune adaptogen. And so um, I do some form of adaptogenic herb daily, depending on what's going on. And so for this interview, I knew I wanted to be on my game. And so, um, you know, the matcha tea helps with that. But then when you combine it with herbs, it really amplifies the effects. Yeah. And it's definitely important to, you know, see your practitioner and, and figure out what herbs you should be taking. Like you said earlier, not just throw anything on the flame. A lot of people will think, oh, based on these symptoms, I have low cortisol. I'm going to go take licorice. Mm-hmm. What licorice does is it extends the half-life of cortisol. So the analogy is kind of like hooking your phone up to one of those external battery mm-hmm. packs. Mm-hmm. However, um, depending on other cause, other causes and symptoms of the adrenal issues, uh, you could make yourself worse. And some women have triggered panic attacks and such Mm -hmm. by going straight to something very stimulating like licorice. So you really do want to work with a practitioner that's, you know, that's done this a thousand times. That way you're not just guessing and checking. Because the last thing I want you to do is try something you've heard like licorice and then you have a panic attack and then you think, well, what do I do now? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have time for one more question? Of course. Okay. Would you be able to talk about MTFR gene mutation? Sure. MTHFR, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, genetic- and how that impacts adrenal fatigue. Yeah, so genetic mutations, basically what we're speaking of here, the MTHFR, it's one of the most popular genetic mutations. Like there's many that you have. We all have genetic mutations. And I think but it's about over 50% of the population has it, correct? Y- yeah, it's huge. It's huge. And now what the issue is, is that people are not able to convert their inactive nutrients from their active nutrients. So you've got a cycle in the body called methylation, which is a way that you manufacture energy. And many people could be taking supplements like B vitamins, but they may be taking cyanocobalamin, for example, which is an inactive form of vitamin B12, which is 
connected to a cyanide molecule. Mm. And your body, with the process of methylation, has to convert cyanocobalamin to methylcobalamin. So really the long of it, short, is a lot of people have genetic issues. I treat everyone like they have MTHFR genetic defects anyway, which includes me using methylated vitamins. Mm. And that's really all it boils down to. But yeah, if you're not methylating properly, yes, you can have adrenal issues. I did a podcast with a guy named Dr. Albert Mensa. Great podcast. He really summarized it great for me. And he said, MTHFR is one good uh, piece of the puzzle, but it's not 90% of the problem. Some practitioners, their whole business model is wrapped around that genetic mutation. But if you just focus on that and ignore everything else, your results are going to be limited. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I am curious to know, is there anything else, any other advice that you'd have for people who are suffering from adrenal, adrenal fatigue? Totally. I've got a list here. Okay. And uh, I'm just kind of uh, reading this from my article. I wrote an article about adrenal issues that got shared. It looks like 2.3 thousand times. So it must have been wow. pretty cool. Um, here's the tips. Engage in mild exercise. Uh, avoid horror movies and TV stimulation. I remember when I had adrenal issues, um, actually, like I mentioned in the beginning of this, I, I'm a wounded warrior. Um, mm -hmm. When I was living in Texas and I was at my worst with adrenal issues, we went and saw the movie Captain Phillips where uh, Tom Hanks, he's, cap he's the captain of this boat. Uh, these Somalian pirates come and hijack this boat. Very violent, you know, guns are blazing in this movie. I had a panic attack in the movie theater. I had to leave. Ooh, wow. I, left the, I left the movie theater. Wow. Um, when you're so frazzled and you're, you're so adrenally stressed, you've got like a trigger fuse, like the smallest loud bang and you're jumping or, yeah. oh, and you're just snapping and you're, you're falling apart. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of horror yeah. movies and, you know, I, stuff like that. I can that. relate to that. When my boyfriend is watching, you know, uh, action movies, I have to leave the room. Yeah, it's too much. Yeah. So um, avoid loud and excessively stimulating music. So for me, my, mainly because we have a baby too, but the only station we play in the in the car radio now is the classical station, mm. Mozart, mm -hmm. stuff like that, Beethoven. Mm -hmm. um, seek out funny things. So laughter is great. Uh, don't take yourself so seriously, which I think is really profound. Uh, reduce cell phone and technology use. Avoid heated arguments and don't feed them. Some people, what happens with adrenal issues, this is the emotional component, is that uh, people, they're so tired, they're so exhausted that they create drama because mm. drama energizes them. Mm, so when they're in an argument, they're in a fight, they like to create drama because they're so tired that that drama gives them a boost of adrenaline. Wow. You'll see it. There's people out there that you'll see and they are just always in the middle of something. You want to pull yourself away. Uh, energy vampires, you got to get rid of them. If there's toxic people in your life, cut them out. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's your friend or your family member that's been around 20 years. It doesn't matter. If they're making you sick and you feel worse or the thought of you hanging out with that person makes you feel terrible, your intuition says, this is not a good situation. Mm -hmm. You go to lunch with that person and you leave feeling like life sucks. Mm -hmm. Maybe you reevaluate that relationship. Yeah. Um, go camping, forest bathing which I talk a lot about, known as Shinrin Yoku, it's been proven to normalize cortisol levels. Mm. Uh, there's studies where they took a control group and walked them through the city on sidewalks, through like an urban area, and the study group went into the forest, and they tested pre and post salivary cortisol levels, and they found that the group that was immersed in the forest had much more normal cortisol levels and that the city group had an um, imbalanced cortisol rhythm. So it's another reason I'm moving out even further out into nature. Yeah. Um, I did we talked about caffeine this past weekend. Perfect. <laughs> Love it. Uh, go yeah. to bed by 10 PM every night. This is essential even on the weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to take naps if necessary. Sometimes mm -hmm. people need naps. Mm -hmm. Hug your friends and family. Um, oxytocin. There's a lot of cool research on the love hormone. So hugs and kisses, uh, avoid yelling and arguments as much as possible. So, if you are in a situation, you're going to get shaky and oh, I'm anxious, just settle down. Try not to create arguments. Try to talk through things gently as possible. Epsom salt baths are great. Float tanks, sensory deprivation tanks are great. Mm. And I wrote the last tip was generally take it easy. Mm. Um, 
a lot of stress and adrenal issues are self-induced, like I mentioned, and people know this, they know it. They know that they've set the bar too high or they're never happy because they think they're gonna be happy once they do something else. Just be grateful. If you live in the United States, your life is amazing. Even if you're broke and you know, you've, you're know you jobless right now and things are tough, your life is still better than someone in Somalia right now where we're having a massive famine mm -hmm. in East Africa where you've got hundreds if not thousands at this point of people dying of just the simple lack of water mm -hmm. and there's emergency services trying to bring in water. It's like I have water on my desk right here. And I may just sip on this water and not even think anything about it. But somebody on this planet right now wishes mm. they could have just a sip of clean water. Mm. So be grateful for what you have. Because if you're not grateful when you have it, then it, what's the point? Mm -hmm. For me, gratitude is the ultimate attitude. Mm. And it's cliche, but cliches aren't there for no reason cliches yeah. you ought to start paying more attention to cliches um, gratitude is the answer and yeah. i do a five minute meditation about gratitude every morning and evening mm -hmm. uh, when i wake up i focus on what i'm grateful for and what i intend to do with my day and then the evening i focus on what happened to me that day that i'm grateful for and everyday things like my daughter my wife things that i love and i'm grateful for and that really pulls you out of that fight or flight stress response so I think that's a good place to wrap up, which is that, you know, when you get done listening to this, go and sit with yourself for a few minutes and just think and even write it out, journal it if you want to, just a few things that you're grateful for and um, really close your eyes and just focus on it. You know, put your hand on your heart and just focus on the love and the gratitude you have for whatever. It could be something as simple as clean water that's not infected with, you know, parasites. It could be... Uh, you're grateful for electricity. You could be grateful for the internet. You could be grateful for socks, mm -hmm. having clothes, having the ability to go lay down on the couch. I mean, we are so spoiled. We live such a life of luxury and we don't even know it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to do that myself because I could use some gratitude today. <laughs> yeah, everybody can. Yeah, I love it. Well, Evan, thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. I know we've gone you know, over a bit, but... I just appreciate every minute, you know, it was packed full of really useful information. So thank you so much. Totally. It's my pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all tomorrow on the next interview. Bye. Bye. Let's see. I'm trying to stop the recording. Maybe I... Hey guys, we are back because we forgot some really important information. Evan has a free gift for us. So Evan, could you please tell us about that, which ties in perfectly to what we're talking about today? Yes. Yeah, so I've got two. So one is I've got a three-part video series that people can sign up for. You'll get an email each day for three days of a new video. Uh, the first video is on adrenal issues, adrenal signs, symptoms, and then more about treatment. What are the solutions? We hit a lot on causes, and we did hit on some treatment stuff, but it gets really geeky. So that's the first video that's free. And then the second and third are on parasites, which is what I've dealt with. And the third is on copper toxicity. And so all you do, you just Google my name, Evan Brand, or just go to my website, notjustpaleo.com. And at the bottom or in the top, it's in the menu bar, free video course or free video training. And then at the bottom of my website, there's an opt-in box. So you just put in your email. I'm not going to spam you, but that's how you'll get sent those uh, free videos. And there's a little bit of extra information too with that. And then the second free gift is just a 15-minute free call. So I block out a few hours each month for people that want to chat with me about their health symptoms and their goals. Let me know what's going on see if functional medicine is right for them, see if they're a good fit for care. And, you know, so I chat with them around the world. I've got clients as far as New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, Europe, et cetera, since I do a phone and or Skype based practice. I mean, all the labs that I run, you can send them across the planet and get them back to the state. So once they get to the website, they'll see the option it says work with Evan and they could book that 15 minute free call if they like what they heard. Okay, great. We'll also, we'll post a link to your website as well. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Evan. Take care. You too.